All right, I thought it would be good to cover Akiyama Delio, the end of that, because we talked about that, and a bunch more of Seto vs. Turds, because we didn't really uh, discuss that in detail, because I didn't catch most of the matches, because they were very rude and didn't do so on my time scale. So in this game seven, Akiyama started with, there we go, five, seven, two, five, and three. I think this is pretty logical. If you look at Akiyama's hand, he has a very clear difficulty where he has a lot of upright facing power and a lot of upright corners. So he identifies six, seven, three, twos are more powerful than five, seven, two, five. And um, seven, five, four, three has a more unique power, right? He has three sevens to the right and only one seven to the up, uh, to the up. Interesting way of saying it. Only one seven facing up. And also, unlike 6732 or 6723 and 3, this creates a difficulty for Delhi, right? He has something that Delhi cannot immediately address. And Delhi, as he has been wont to do recently, goes with an opposite corner. And I have generally been a bit skeptical of these. I think he's gotten in a lot of trouble with opposite corners recently when there is something he needs to address on the opponent's board. On the other hand, in general, I think opposite corners are pretty promising if they create a kind of equal challenge for the opponent as their corner created for you. And Akiyama's hand very much does not want to go down left and does not have a capture in four. So that's pretty significant uh, pressure on Akiyama's hand as well. And I would generally kind of on an instinctive basis say, this should be pretty balanced, but also with serious winning chances for both sides, because it is a complex enough position after opposite corners that you have a lot to play for. And in this case, I think the pressure is now pretty clearly on Akiyama. I think this is a very good move, because so much of Akiyama's hand does not want to play in that direction. Delhi doesn't have immediate attacks from two, but his hand in general is not as upset to be going towards three as Akiyama's is to be going towards seven. You'll notice Akiyama has exactly one capture in eight, all of Delhi's cards capture in six, right? There is not parity in the amount of pressure on each of the cards and the limit to, limited tool set to do so. And if we start thinking, okay, what if Akiyama does go in eight? Um, Delhi can probably play something like Four, five, four, five, and nine. If he wants, notice Delhi doesn't have a recapture in four either. But I don't really think he needs it because it's so hard for Akiyama to face downward action. At that point, Akiyama's only capture is seven, five, four, three, and five. And I'm assuming there's play against that, though I don't immediately see it. How bad is this? Can you immediately capture? Does this lose? Okay, this does hold. Um, the other, I think, really natural thing for Akiyama to do, and I'm not sure which card you'd want to put there, but to place something in six. Uh, incidentally, note, anything in red is a loss, anything yellow is a tie. So this is a nice visual to get a sense of stuff. And you can see stuff like, oh, uh, nine is a really good square there after eight. This is this position that it's evaluating. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Nine is a square you're likely to have safety and you force the game to go down. And I like having the quick visual of, okay, nine is a key square, four is a key square, that makes, that's a little weird here because we don't lock in seven. Okay, that's interesting. That four is such a likely square to be good, I think is pretty interesting. Uh, normally four and nine are the two key squares, but that's because four has a lock-in. Here four doesn't have a lock-in, and it's still good enough to tie. That's very interesting. So I, I kind of like this visual for being able to see, uh, what, what the position is kind of telling you of which squares matter. Akiyama goes for safety. Uh, I should say, I think the other really natural thing to do, as I think I was saying, is to put something in six. I'm not sure what. Maybe one of the six, seven, three, twos. I'm not sure which you want out of your hand. Let's pick this one, because that's the one Akiyama played. Um, I think this seems pretty natural. Let's see what the computer says. Okay, so the computer says something interesting which is, you may notice, uh, it's all yellow and red, meaning it hasn't lost. If it lost, you would see green, meaning there's a win. Uh, green is bad for a move you've just made. It's good for your opponent. But we see a lot more yellow than red. And what that usually means is the opponent has a lot of lines that are kind of close to winning, 
and it feels somewhat scary to make a move like this because usually, you know, if there's a, a lot of losses and a few ties for the opponent, your move is probably pretty safe. If there's a lot of ties and a few losses, it's pretty hard to distinguish whether a move loses or ties. But I, I think in general, six makes sense because Delhi has no attack in two. So it's pretty logical to play a card in six and maybe something like this would be better. I don't know. That looks pretty similar. And again, kind of interesting to see, oh, one is actually a key square against that. One is not really a square I would consider in this formation. Four is a key square. Four I would consider more but don't like as much. I would be spending more time looking at eight and nine, um, which actually have fewer ties in them, which is interesting. Again, if you want to look down and explore that, you can. Uh, I think there's stuff to be learned from there that we will not be learning from. Okay, so Akiyama instead goes in four which gets rid of his bad square, but also he doesn't take the chance to lock in his card in three. And I think the numbers now work out in a kind of unlucky way for him. Um, and, and unlucky, obviously, you could have spotted stuff, uh, but I think the numbers happen to work really badly. Because if we go back a few moves, Akiyama has many recaptures in both two and six of his card, if needed. Now, he'll never really need a recapture in six, but he has recaptures in two. So he's pretty happy here, right? And he can recapture with different low numbers facing out that are going to be hard to combo off. The thing is, after this move, his only card that can take back in two has a three and a two facing out. Now, the two and the six, you know, if six, seven, three, two is here. The two and the six don't do much, but the three and the seven concede two sames to Delhi's hand. They also have a same for your hand, but Delhi has first access. So what Delhi does here, and I think this is very precise, uh, I did a quick check before and the solver said going in six was the only win. Now Akiyama can't go in two because, let's just have it tell us, not because we take the combo immediately. That's so interesting. Let's figure this out. Because there's no same. Ah, so of course not. So actually Akiyama has the plus, but Delhi doesn't have a same. So why is this winning? Ah, it's because either card with a four down and five is a problem. So Akiyama can't block that square because four, five, four, five punishes an eight. So if you go one, they take the plus, you win. Sure. But what if they go somewhere else? Why am I being completely oblivious? Oh, that flips. There's a plus and five. I missed the plus and five. That's what I was being oblivious to. And this only flips one thing back. Jeez, can't calculate two moves. We're, we're struggling here. Um, so yeah, really nice calculation that this plus and five would be critical. Rarely does that plus matter. I thought this was because it was a setup against two, but I forgot no same. So it is not a setup against two. Oh, huh, interesting. I really should have checked this in any depth at all before starting to make a video. So, so yeah, six, seven, three, two, and two doesn't work. And if that doesn't work, this is quite dangerous. I guess a natural thing to do might be to go here. But if you go here, you're running out of power to do kind of anything at all, right? You no longer even have an attack against seven. So... I mean, even a move like here looks like it should be enough. Again, if you take, there's the problem of this, which I now understand flips two cards, not one. Um, okay, that one didn't work. Uh, fair enough. Where's the win? Nope, there's not a win here. Uh, sorry, where's the win here? Uh, you go in two or five. Okay, that's fair for me not to have seen immediately. But again, this plus in five really matters, and eight isn't even that good because eight only flips this one card and then there's safety in return. Hmm. Yeah, oh, tricky stuff. Yeah, maybe maybe this, this game deserved the full time of like me watching and being able to comment rather than my like, hopefully it'll be simple to explain in the aftermath having not looked at it in advance. It seems not to be. Tricky game, tricky calculations here. So Akiyama ends up going in five with the hope that I guess three, four, seven, seven can sweep to side to side. But his problem is he can just never take this 3-5-3-7. And 
whatever card he keeps for the bottom either has up power or left power, but never both. It never gets a double capture. So at this point, Akiyama decides to lose in style, which is classy, and goes down 9-1. So Deli wins the series 2-0 and advances to the semifinals, where he will meet a player that I think we shall look at some of their games. So I did cover a little of Turd Seto. But it would be nice to cover more. Um, so let's jump to the two decisive games in Turd Seto and see what they look like. All right, this is game one of Turd Seto of their match. I have not looked at it in advance, so who knows what I'll be saying. But we see a very similar start to the one we just saw Akiyama make. Turd starts in seven, and we can see very similarly. He has two different corner cards, both the one he played and another corner card for three. Three five four seven is argu arguably a corner for three. One six four seven is arguably a corner for three. All his cards belong in three, and so he goes in seven so that they will all be happy to face the action. No, he could have started in three, right? We could think, why didn't he play like a seven six starter in three? Now I assume there is a setup against it, but I have not checked. Make sure I have the hands right. Um, so this isn't a setup because you have a plus and six, but there's no same for two. Am I missing something? Yeah, I am. Okay, there is a setup. That sets up both two and six. Does turds have complementary setups? No, he doesn't even have a same in two. All right, it makes sense he didn't do this. Cool. So he can't use them as their strong corners, so he instead uses it to direct the game and give something easy for him to recapture. Seto, I think very reasonably, let's just get a quick eval dump, see what it looks like. It takes a little while to run. Yeah, so it thinks this is very low pressure, which makes sense, but it thinks it's not losing. And honestly, with a hand with four cards for the same corner, that's all you want out of life. Seto goes in three. Also, we should mention, I think, believe Seto may have been uh, drinking during this game. Seto goes in three. There's a recapture in two, and it is obviously not the direction Turd's hands wants to face. Turd hits, has no attack whatsoever against this card. Uh, this looks like a very natural and strong move. We can see the solver doesn't think it's super high pressure, but I would think this looks like really high pressure. How do you play against this move? Well, yeah, not trivial to figure out what kind of direction you want to go here. I think a very interesting move in four. So if Seto goes in eight with three, six, six, four, or four, six, one, seven, or one, six, seven, four, if Seto goes at eight, Turds his 2276 to cover. So he has spotted, yeah, okay. Take me a little while to see things, but that's okay. Uh, so all of Seto's captures have a 6 facing out to the right. Now that 6247 is out of Seto's hand. So Turds's move is kind of arguing that was actually a major concession from you. If I now lock in my starter, you don't have a way to attack it. And if we look at cards Seto might put in one, he doesn't really have good cards to put in one either, right? Anything with a six there is susceptible to combo, as we know, though 2276 now uses its other two to combo, but he doesn't even need to use 2276. He could save that for later. He could use 3547 to combo anything with a six facing out from one. He can combo anything that would naturally land in eight, uh, Seto's only card that doesn't have a 6 to the right is a 5 to the right, and if that lands in 1, he can combo that as well with 3547. So 3547 controls 1, and 2276 controls 8. 2276 also does a really good job controlling 1, but it's really good that you don't need it to, because A, you want to have different cards for other roles. If you're too reliant on one card, they can play in one square, force you to use it and then they have access to the other square. 
and two, 2276 landing and two punishing one is not actually that great because 3664 could reply in five. So I guess the question is, should turds, blocking four seems like a really good idea. Should he block it with 1647 or 4671? Those seem like the two extraneous cards in his hand, and I'm excited to see if he finds nice use for 4671 going forward that 1647 could not have done. Okay, so from Seto's perspective, you don't really have a way to engage with Turds' board. So, I think the natural thing to do is build out from your own safety, either going in 2 or 6. Now, if you know me at all, you know I have a massive preference for 2 in these positions. And I notice if that if we play something in 2 with a 7 down, maybe we can land 3, 6, 6, 4, and 5, right? We set up a combo in 5 that is not shared. And not only does that not set up our opponent in 6, they do have a plus wall, but they don't have a plus, right? That's really important. They don't flip 3. Um, it does set up a plus for us in 8 with 1, 6, 7, 4. Maybe not a plus we can use. So I'm not sure about this, but my instinct would be something like this, setting up 3, 4, 6, 6 both ways. Now it does give 4, 6, 7, 1 really good use, and it might just be that something like this, 2, 2, 7, 6, dominates you too much, but I think it doesn't. Uh, you can't use that card because there's a, no, there's not, a, there is a plus, yeah, I can add. I can totally add. This looks like a tie turn. So I, I think, let's see if I'm wrong, 5, 5, 7, 1, and the only tie is 4, 6, 7, 1, and 1. So I think that would have been a nice way for Seto to flip. Let's see if there's anything better. There is a win here. Ah, so the correct thing was to build out from 6 with 5, 5, 7, 1. Now, Seto chooses a different card for 6 in 1, 6, 7, 4. Ah, but Turds has really good side-to-side -side sweepers, as we've seen. I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. I'll pause. It's sneezing a season for me. And so Turds blocks 5, and suddenly 3, 5, 4, 7, and 2, 2, 7, 6 dominate. Seto has such a hard time. He can't ever play in 1. He has to go in 2, or he, you know, he gets comboed in 1. If he goes in 2, 3, 5, 4, 7 just takes him, unless he goes with 4, 7, 1, 6. But if he does so, the problem is he has no captures on the bottom rack. Yeah, just no captures. And it's just lost, all of a sudden. He ends up going one, walking into the combo in two, and then going in eight, walking into further combo. It only flips two extra cards. He loses six, four. But there's, I think, nothing here. I think this is just a win. It's a kind of remarkable turnaround, where I'd be really drawn to two here, but actually six was the key move. And so our question is, why does six work when this didn't? Why is this now winning? And I think it must be that 1674 has this plus wall in two. There's a combo set up. And so my guess is, also it comboed through, so 4617 now has these plus walls. If we look at the game, he did put a 7 down, right? But 2 isn't flipped, so it never combos through. So I would guess the key here is 5-5-7-1 five, five, with the game continuation. Now, there are, of course, other lines you could try, but you know, they all apparently lose. The game continuation, it forces a combo. Suddenly, 4-6-1-7 is amazing down here, and the combos back don't matter because the 4 doesn't overpower either of the 7s. That's going to flip at least three cards and maybe stuff up top. Uh, there might even be multiple wins here. Yeah, there are. Uh, you can start in eight or nine. Simply four, six, one, seven, and nine. Even though that can be flipped, we now get hit with the other combo, the one, six, seven, four, staying in the hand that's key. Uh, very interesting. I mean, this is a really hard position to play. I think I would play in two probably with this is most likely, and Turds would have played here, and we would have tied. Seto came much closer to the winning move, but the winning move requires walking into extra combo potential. Note the solver also said this was a win, and the point is anything you take with is weak to the huge combo chain. Um, yeah, I'm, 
makes sense. Huh. Really have to have good combo feel to play this right. And Seto did actually come very close to finding this win, which I, I do not think was an easy win to find. So Turds takes game one. Now, I've noticed something in Turds' games. He has had a number of games where I thought he was in trouble. He was, in fact, lost. And then a move or two later, Turds wins. I know that's how I've talked about Seto's games as well, but I think... The game I'm thinking of that this has happened with Turds before was a game against Piggy Man. And Piggy Man played the move I thought was winning and it was losing. I think Turds has a really good feel for these kind of 3 6, 4 7 type setups that move into Z's. Because in both these games, there was just some little extraneous combo that lined stuff up and it went all in Turds' favor both times. Now that's a sample of two. But it's pretty interesting. This is also to say, I've talked a bit recently, I think one of my weaknesses is when I'm lost, I am not good at providing resistance. Now, Turds is obviously not lost very often, but when he is lost, he is very good at providing resistance. And I also do not blame him for being lost here, right? He is a hand with four corners for the same corner, and he wins a game against Seto, right? That's remarkable, whether or not he's lost on the way there. And Seto makes, to my eyes, very, very reasonable looking moves here. You know, note that Seto's move in six sets Seto up for a plus in five, a plus wall in nine. Uh, it makes three safe. Like, we didn't really talk much about the actual move, but, you know, how could this be bad, right? Interesting game. All right, we're going to skip to uh, Turds' other win in the match. Um, we did a little coverage of games in between, but I guess today is just showing... Uh, decisive games. All right, I didn't list the game number here, but it was technically game number d -d -d 10. Uh, the one game was a timeout, and they agreed to replay. Though Turds was actually winning in the position they timed out as well. I think Seto forgot that S wasn't in play, uh, which I can't really blame him for, because last time I played Seto, I forgot that uh, Plus Wall wasn't in play. Now, I think I would have lost that game anyway. I completely collapsed uh, in every sense, and he played well. But, uh, you know, can't blame someone for forgetting a rule. Anyway, there was a timeout there. They agreed to replay. But technically, Turds did win this match 3-0, which is unbelievable. Um, uh, I mean, technically, he won 2-0, obviously. But in a way, he won 3-0. So Seto started in 5, and I have kind of opined quite a bit that Seto is unbeatable except when he plays in five early. Now, if we look at his previous loss, he did not play in five early, proving me wrong. However, his timeout position was from a poor move in five. Uh, of course, it was poor because he thought he was setting up a same and it wasn't, but, you know, ignore that. That's fine. Um, we'll pretend it fits my thesis. And this game, he goes in five early and Turds is eventually able to win. Now, Seto's hand kind of is a three-corner hand, or a four-corner hand if you count six, four, five, three for seven, but the corners are a bit clunky together. It has a lot of twos and threes to the right. Like, it looks like the cards are more powerful than their synergy together, to my eye. On the other hand, Turds' hand on the right also isn't any great shakes. Some nice seven sixes, not particularly well aligned, but not terrible or anything. Yeah, looks, looks like normal hand. And Turds goes in two. Now, my instinct is when you meet a center starter in two, or in eight, you are saying, I want the game to be up-down. So does Turds control the up-down? And he does, in fact, control sevens down in both one and three through pluses, right? One, six, seven, four can plus a seven down in three, and three, seven, five, four can plus a seven down in one. What about sixes down? Well, seven, six, three, two gives good control of that. All right. This wouldn't have struck me as hands where you'd really want to be making the game up down. Right? Both hands have a seven up and a seven down, and it doesn't strike me as like, ah, yes, I have an up down advantage. Setter goes one. Maybe he just missed the plus and four. 
I don't know. Messy match from Seto, clearly. Uh, on the other hand, he just won Ultimecia, playing absolutely perfectly, so, you know, we can excuse a messy match here. Now, when Turds does this, there is a big combo chain, right? If you have combo potential against any of these cards, you combo all of them. Now, there is currently no combos on board, but anything that you set up is really dangerous, but is there anything to set up? This, for instance, sets up six, but it doesn't set up anywhere else. Oh, I'm curious to see what he tried here. He played five, six, six, one, and seven, which does set up eight, so Turds presumably has to block eight, and he does, walking into a plus wall, but the plus wall doesn't hurt him, and six, three, five, five is dead at the end. Sure. Um, so Seto keeps the card that has more capture potential. Wait, what? Yeah, okay. But it's only a single capture. Let me move. Huh. There we go. Um, and Turds wins. I don't know if I have a ton to say about that game. That feels like a, a plus was missed and then everything spiraled. But also if we look at this position, when you don't it's not just that you can't play in one or three immediately. It's that if you can't like play safely in one or three, it can be really hard to find moves here because you're often about to start conceding safety. Like, say you make a move like this, right? They have potential safety here if they want it. They have potential safety not there, but here if they want it, right? There's like, there's a bunch of safety for turds that Seto doesn't have. We've sort of done the plug in reverse, right? Where the plug is meeting a side starter with five in a way that controls the two squares next to it. Here, five was met by a side, but the squares next to that side are controlled by that move in five. Let's see what, let's see how dangerous this was. That's pretty dangerous. Um, going in one was actually a good idea. Four is the square with the most ties. That is absurd. So this is three ties that, like, no human that isn't Italian is ever going to play. So, you know, you can just write these off. So we have two ties in one. We have two ties in seven and two ties in eight. Everything in nine loses. Man, this is high pressure. Seven includes using three, two, seven, six. That feels like a card you should hold on to. One other thing I'm getting is 5661 wasn't doing anything and really needs to come out of the hand. Now, that's not super obvious to me looking at these hands. For instance, I think, that's my only right power. I need to get 6355 or one of the other cards out of my hand. This would actually be a card I'd really be tempted to hold on to. So again, if you wanted to uh, you know, think about this position, this would be a good place to start and try to learn from it, is why are the lines where you use 5661? the most likely to be ties. Because there are two clear patterns here. One is four is actually the most promising square. And two is you want to use five, six, six, one for reasons. Yeah, I don't get it. And I'm not going to take the time to figure it out. But hopefully all the material is there. It gives a variation. Uh, the variation it gives is not necessarily the best moves, but it's like it's a plausible continuation of the game. It's what kind of it thinks is best based on some kind of finding algorithm. There's no mistakes there, but it's not necessarily the highest pressure moves. So I would take the lines as that's an important line, but not like the important line necessarily. Yeah. All right. Um, so those are the uh, fi ends of the semifinals. I think Often the wins are not why a match is all that great, and here, at least in the Seto Turrets game, I thought the ties that I managed to catch live were very interesting, and these games not as interesting. But also, I remember, um, I remember Slash beat Yojimbo in something, long time ago, and Slash has beaten Yojimbo in a few things, so I'm not exactly sure what it was, but I think it was Sid, where Slash went on to beat me as well. If Slash didn't play Yojimbo in that bracket, then it was, but it was something in that vicinity of time. And I remember asking Slash what happened, and he basically said, like, he went in a corner, I went in the opposite corner with a well-protected big corner starter, because that's what Slash does. And uh, then he made a move, and then I was just played some more safe cards, and I was winning, and it was not a very hard game. And 
Yojimbo was not at the peak of his powers yet, though Slash also beat Yojimbo at the peak of his powers, so he was very capable of doing so. But Yojimbo was very, very, very good at that point in time. And it was it was an example of a game where the actual win against most top players is, oh, something didn't click, right? Something didn't click that day. Sometimes it's they missed a plus. Sometimes it's just like you made a move and none of the natural responses made sense to them or the responses that seemed natural to them, none of them clicked. Like imagine in this position, if, a, if, if the only ties here were in four, pretend the only ties are in four. It might be that tying would take something really remarkable like that. But maybe there's like one tie in seven as well, but it's really hard to differentiate which card ties and it just happens not to click. And the move they do end up going there, they end up finding, okay, they don't find the move in four, but four would be ridiculous. They do find that seven is the key square and they picked a slightly wrong card there, but with a slightly wrong card, it doesn't work at all. But they actually came kind of close to the right idea. Like Seto's losing move in the last game was in six, but six was the right square. But I think you just often find sometimes the decisive games in a match, and I've tried to highlight these in my best games of the year, but you'll notice a lot of my best games of the year don't come from tournaments, are either just look like a normal game where the really strong player just didn't do anything or just missed something that feels kind of obvious. And that's going to happen at some rate to everyone. So any any single game doesn't mean all that much on that front. The question is, who can minimize those situations long term? Both who can minimize falling into positions which are going to be tricky for you to play, and who has the fewest blank spots when they fall into those positions. Which is all to say, I think five starters are bad, because I think you will fall into a lot of positions that are hard to make click off of five starters. Because the opponent can play in two or eight and make it up down, and maybe that's difficult for your hand. They can play a four or six and make it side to side. Maybe that's difficult for your hand. Or they can pick out a corner that either is tough for you to take, and it's more important to be able to take corners than a center card because corners are much easier to lock in, right? If you play a center card, they can only take three ways out of four. They can still take it three ways. If you play a quarter card, they can only take one way, well, you're threatening to block that way, right? You have instant follow-ups and ideas, and the center doesn't come with kind of natural follow-ups or play. And the other thing is, if you go in a center and they go in a corner, they got to set up the interaction, so they're the one that's going to have more combo synergy. This is not to say center starters should never be played. I, in fact, played one recently, though notably, I was losing off that center starter. I didn't end up losing that game, but uh, it was a game versus Midas, and I should have lost it. Um, though I thought the best move was the one he played, and then I found a miracle tie. Um, so we both actually thought his move was winning, uh, and then I was just very lucky. So, point is, I, I think, I love the center attack, I think it's a fun way to play, and if actually Seto's card here had been safe, I think his position is quite good. The center attack being, you go in the center, and wherever they go, you go somewhere next to that card trying to build out safety. I think that actually can force some kind of promising structures and is not an implausible way to play. But center starters in general, despite that, I think are are dangerous, risky, and allow your opponent a lot of control over the game. And when they have that much control, it's easy to fall into whatever types of positions you have blind spots in. So my big takeaway on this is, please keep playing center starters set up because we need a chance against you. But I, 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 do, I do still believe that this is his primary weakness. On the other hand, Turds appears to have no weakness at all at the moment. Uh, Turds played just fantastically throughout this match and has been really good right now. But we'll face Deli all in the finals, uh, a storied finals. Of course, they have met a bunch of times. I did a video at the very start of the return about their rivalry. Uh, the only time they've met recently in a major was in the Cosmos, that's what it is, the Cosmos Finals, which is the other tour finals. And Turds won twice in closed, and Seto won once in open. Oh, uh, sorry, Deli won once in open. So Turds ended up taking the title there. Um, this one will be in open, which you might think, given that, favors Deli, and probably does, but like Turds has been playing incredibly, incredibly in open. 
and I, I think it's going to be a really good even match, and it's fun that it's three games, and the one downside is the rule set is horrible and needs to be changed, so maybe it will actually just be awful. But if it's not awful, it will be great. Do you have anything else to say? Yeah, if you were a bookie here, right, you know, you have to make Deli all favorite, but I don't think it's big favorite, right? I think it's I think it's more a 55-45 or 60-40 than like a 75-25 where we all know he's going to win. Best of three tends to give a slightly bigger advantage to the favorite, but it's not actually that much. Like, if you had someone as 60-40 favorite, I think best of three mathematically makes it now more like 65-35. Uh, which is not, you know, which is some swing, you know, more, a bigger sample helps the favorite, but not as big as you might think. And also it's, you know, it, it might be closer to 50-50. I don't know. Uh, Delhi played awesome versus Akiyama. Spectacular match. He played quite shaky versus Cliffy. Turds has, I believe, over the course of the tournament, played more consistently well. But Delhi, as is Delhi's want, has been kind of swingy with it, right? Fantastic against Akiyama, shaky against Cliffy. Um, probably been a little shakier in open results overall of recent. I don't know. Obviously, I love them both. I want the best for both of them. Uh, for legacy concerns, I guess I'm supposed to be rooting for turds, because if Delhi wins this, that is his eighth major, and he will become the only player of all time with eight majors, passing uh, myself and Yojimbo. On the other hand, I think that would be pretty great. I think Delhi with eight majors is kind of, like, if there's one player that should have the most majors, doesn't it feel like it's Delhi? And I also, what I, the other thing I'd really like about Delhi winning this is Delhi has already won the biggest variety of tournaments of any of the players, right? He's won Open SEs. He's won Open Triad Wars. He has won Team Rhinoa. He has won one of the all-closed tournaments, of which there weren't very many, but he won one of them, Onion Knight. He has now recently won TTAC. That was his most recent title. He has won TTN tournaments. Delhi has won the most tournaments of different formats. But this, an open random tournament, is a new format, and having Delhi as the first winner, I think would really fit in his streak of he has won every type of tournament, and he will, if he wins this, have won more tournaments than anyone else. On the other hand, if you look at Turds, uh, Turds was a good player who then broke through with a great performance in Vincent. He was very strong for a few years after that, he would say he dropped off a lot, but if you look at the players he went out against in tournaments, his results were actually still quite good, given the opposition. Um, then he trailed off for a few years, and then he came back kind of late in the site's initial run, and was very good um, there as well. But in the return, and some people have called him most improved, and I, I think he was always very good, but I think he's really shown in a way where he was very good. He wins 2008 Player of the Year, or ties for it with Delhi, either wins it or ties with Delhi. But I don't think at any point anyone would have had him in the same conversation as the very best on the site. He could be in the next tier or the tier below that, but I, I think... You know, I, I've kept track of results for years quite well, and he's really right up there with with the best, the very best. And he wins Carver in the return, and that's a kind of weird tournament. Like, I'd value Vincent much higher than Carver. And then he wins Cosmos. Now, Cosmos has a bunch of closed, which he does very well in, but again, I'd value it lower, right? Carver, he beats Vialva in a really tough finals where Vialva played so well in game one um, and really well in games two and three as well. So really tough finals there, but the rest of the path is is nothing. And then he wins Cosmos, which is for me a kind of hard tournament to judge. If he wins Kefka here too, he will have won both tour finals tournaments. He will reach 
four tournaments won, becoming... Do you know how many players have won four tournaments? The count is very small. He will be the fifth player to have won four tournaments. I often say that Mount Rushmore is Deli Alcedo, Yojimbo, and myself. Uh, for tournament results, of course. You might argue other people for other things. And Doc Evil does have a case to be there. Turds will be the only player not on Mount Rushmore with four titles. If he wins this. And that would be really cool as well. So... Yeah, I, I think I think big for both, but already making the finals is great for both. You know, a finals run is never a bad result for any player, uh, despite the fact that a finals run is inevitably the most heartbreaking result for any player, right? Uh, any finals result did great, and you have, you know, done phenomenally, no matter what your average performance is. But it is the most heartbreaking. Anyway, uh, nice to see these two. I don't think I have too much more to say on Legacy of Babel Bond. Quite long about kind of nothing. But fun to see these two in the finals. Uh, I wish they both could lose. And yeah, that's about it.